I, at least I was told. I'm not going to, you know, try to uh, speak for anyone else here. But uh, I was always told, and uh, like uh, whether it was by like you know media commercials or like my parents, you know, that like college is like, you know, this like really like intellectual academic environment. It's not. And, and, and yeah, exactly. And that's why <laughs> I was. I was, I was talking to my, my parents about this and I was like, you know, it's not, it's not challenging. Uh, it's not intellectual at all. It's, 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 yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not enjoying this at all. It's the biggest scam they've got going, Shane. Like what they do is they'll just, they're just selling you this piece of paper that employers apparently put way too much, um, emphasis on. And, uh, then what they do is they lower standards progressively. So you need another piece of paper and then you need another piece of paper. And all the while you're wasting time, not working, not getting experience, and you're paying them thousands and thousands of dollars. Tuning into Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for libertarianism in action. We provide you with real free market solutions using the freedom umbrella of direct action to give you the tools necessary to increase your own personal liberty. As Ludwig von Mises said, liberty is always freedom from the government. And now your host, Shane. And welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism in action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the communist state of Illinois. Well, we are back in the mix of things, so much so that the rest of January is completely booked up with some great content that I think you guys are going to find very valuable. For right now, I'm not going to go into any more detail on that, as I'm still not sure I'm going to edit and release a four-hour podcast I recorded earlier this week, but nonetheless, we're back to our steady stream of content. Liberty Under Attack is covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at BIPCOT.org. So a couple of quick production notes. Uh, first off, I have released the entire direct action series for free. I was selling it for $10 a pop and did sell some copies, but uh, it would have taken way too much work to uh, get that ready You know, to, uh, to really, really sell. And uh, also, it's just way too important uh, to delay it any longer. So, all you have to do is go to libertyunderattack.com forward slash freedom now, fill out the form, and you'll be re redirected to your destination. When you get to that page, you'll see a couple of links to download the entire thing with one click, or you can peruse the table of contents to find what interests you. Again, that link is libertyunderattack.com forward slash freedom now. Uh, go get your copy today. So, the plan for tonight's podcast is this. First off, I've re recently finished reading Matt Battaglioli's book, The Consequences of Equality, and we'll begin with my review. Following that, you'll catch the discussion we had earlier this week on a whole slew of subjects, such as the judicial monopoly, the ethical consequences of equality, the dangers of moral relativism, as well as a conversation about secession. I've already come out against it for many reasons, and Matt thinks that we should, we should support all secession movements. So yeah, we had a nice little uh, back and forth discussion uh, on that subject. So let's get to my review. So as someone who frequently reads books on Austrian economics and libertarian philosophy, I certainly appreciate books like, you know, Mises' Human Action that get into all sorts of nuance and minutia. But there's also a place for shorter run-throughs of important, relevant subjects, such as the focus of Matt's book. I found his book, The Consequences of Equality, to be a quick, enlightening read. Sure, a lot of the stuff he discussed I had already been familiar with, but the book definitely gave me some more argumentative ammunition for when I inevitably end up in a future debate with someone who subscribes to the equality agenda. The way it is laid out also really portrays the dangers of egalitarianism well. It is something that is certainly of concern, as it infects every aspect of society. That is, economic, political, ethical, and cultural. I thought his discussion on the ethical and cultural consequences were some of his best work found therein. As someone who places a high value on ethics and morality, I appreciate that the most. Take this for example, quote, Well, egalitarians very often take the moral high ground, claiming hierarchical institutions to be categorically immoral, and by comparison, their own system of equality to be the most moral. This is far from the case. Egalitarianism blurs morality, often even dividing it between people. It fosters moral relativism and causes people to lose their own sense of right and wrong. 
In fact, all right and wrong effectively becomes legal and illegal, and even this is a matter of pure arbitration. By no realistic means can one argue consistently that the natural order, an albeit hierarchical society built on nature's given institutions of private property and a law nobody is exempt from or able to manipulate, is morally inferior to the relativist cesspool that the democratic socialist states have created today. End quote. Now, there was one point of disagreement, and that is on secession. That said, we'll cover that in the interview, so I'll, I'll, leave, I'll, I'll leave that uh, uh, there for now. In conclusion, I definitely recommend picking up this book. It is long enough to be an in-depth overview, but short enough that you could realistically give this to a family member or a friend. You can pick it up today while supporting LUA by visiting tinyurl.com forward slash LUA. Again, that's tinyurl.com forward slash LUA. On to the interview. Hey, Shane here. I'm joined by Matt Battaglioli, the author of The Consequences of Equality. Uh, so first off, how are you doing today, uh, uh, Matt? Oh, I'm doing real good. Doing real good. How are you doing, Shane? Oh, I'm, d I'm doing quite well. Uh, for those uh, who missed our, our first interview a uh, couple months back, I think it was actually in September. I may be wrong on that. But uh, for those who missed that, uh, why don't you tell the listeners a uh, little about yourself? Oh, well, let's see. I'm 22 years old now. I'm a student at George Mason University studying economics. I uh, wrote my first book, had it published back in July, ebook back in uh, August. Currently working on my second book. Um, and uh, right now I'm just uh, waiting for school to start back up. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, I guess uh, uh, for, for those like me that have read your first book and uh, are excited for your uh, future releases, uh, can you give us, a, 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 is, is it too early for a sneak, like a sneak peek? Let's let us know what the subject matter is going to be. Uh, are you, are you going to withhold that? <laughs> well, um, I mean, I can, I'll give you what I know for sure. Um, and uh, it's going to have a lot of uh, content that was similar to my first book, but only when it's necessary. So uh, what I'm really doing this one on is um, a deconstruction of um, a, a leftist's worldview. And this is going to go into a lot of different topics so far. Um, I've got some stuff on methodology that I've written, stuff on central banking, stuff on race. And then I'm going to go into um, things like feminism, um, things like, um, I guess, uh, secession, things like the welfare state. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on individualism versus nationalism versus, you know, collectivism. And uh, so this is going to be really good. I don't have a whole lot done, but I have a good outline. I've got a, a reasonable amount done for certain chapters. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, and, and you're going to George Mason. I know uh, I, I met uh, Daniel Rothschild at, uh, at Anarchon and, uh, uh -huh. and he's at, he actually goes to George Mason, uh, George Mason, I'm pretty sure too, for economics. He does. Yeah, he does. Okay. Awesome. Are you familiar with him at all? Uh, yeah, him and I went to uh, Mises University 2014 together, and uh, he was also at Anarchon 2015 when I met him there again. Awesome. Okay. Good deal. Good deal. So uh, you mentioned your book, The Consequences of Equality, and uh, yes. I I've been kind of ch uh, checking up on it uh, on Amazon, and I also put my review there, uh, but it, it seems like it's consistently out of stock. Uh, now that, that, that seems like a good sign, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, it, uh, it's been out of stock. I mean... I mean, at least uh, five times, and uh, you know, it's it, it's not only sold on Amazon too. You know, I mean, it's sold in a lot of outlets, and they tends to usually be out of stock in all of them. And yeah, it's a very good sign, selling very well. Awesome. Well, that's that's definitely good to uh, definitely good to hear. And yeah, I, I actually completed that uh, over uh, over the holiday break, and uh, I must say, well done, sir. I uh, definitely thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank uh, you. Yeah, not a problem, not a problem. So to support LUA and get his, and uh, to get his book, and I highly recommend you do, uh, just visit tinyurl.com forward slash LUA. Again, that's tinyurl.com forward slash LUA, And uh, that will be in the show notes for this episode as well, so you can find those at libertyunderattack.com. Uh, uh, so I guess also congrats on being uh, this month's LUA Quote of the Month. I, I uh, uh, took one of your uh, quotes and... Uh, uh, yeah, your quote, quote of the month for uh, for January 2017. So congratulations on that. I mean, it's not like it's highly competitive or anything, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, hopefully it'll uh, you know uh, I don't know uh, intrigue some individuals into you know actually like purchasing uh, purchasing a copy of it. So yeah, uh, hopefully. Thank you for that too. I noticed that. I uh, appreciate it. Not a problem, not a problem. So uh, uh, let's go ahead and, and move forward here. So this discussion will be more focused than our last one. I, th I and, and I don't think we'll go as deep into the philosophy parts. Uh, I guess we, we could. I, I don't know where the conversation's going to go. Uh, but anyways, here's the plan. Uh, we'll start with a discussion on the judicial monopoly. 
uh, move okay. on to the ethical consequences of equality. And then I'd like to get into, you know, a discussion on moral relativism and uh, the dangers stemming from it. And I'll kind of toss in some of my uh, a posteriori, you know, observations uh, from from a higher level indoctrination college uh, and, uh, and, and some other uh, observations. So uh, how does that sound? That sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, the judicial monopoly. So I'd like to start with uh, a quote from Christopher Chase Rachel's book, uh, A Spontaneous Order. I think this quote was actually a quote of the month, too. Uh, but I, I found it uh, really, really uh, profound, and I'd like to get, you, get your thoughts on it. Quote, sure. The state as final arbiter of disputes does not allow the verdict of competing arbitration agencies to supersede its own. By definition, any uninvited initiation of physical force or the threat thereof against the persons or property of others is condemned by the non-aggression principle. Thus, the state's status as ultimate arbiter and the means by which it is, in, which it is enforced are illegitimate and unjustified. End quote. Uh, so I guess what my, my kind of takeaway from that is really, really well, I, I haven't read his book yet, uh, but I did notice uh, that quote when I was, you know, just kind of scanning through. Uh, but it kind of uh, illegitimizes uh, America's so-called constitutional government. So, I mean, w w uh, do you agree with them? Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely agree with him. I mean, it doesn't just illegitimize America's constitutional government. I mean, really, anywhere in the world where you're going to see a total monopoly on the judiciary, uh, that's going to be a relevant thing to say about it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, I, I certainly agree, too. Uh, in your book, uh, you make the point that uh, no matter what form of government, the judicial monopoly is always present. Uh, so, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Yeah, it, does, it does expand beyond uh, constitutional government. But Sure. Uh, um, the judicial monopoly is always present, and uh, that is one of the most dangerous monopolies. Uh, now, could you explain why you, why you hold that position? I agree, but well, I, I'd just like to, yeah. to get your thoughts on that. Uh, well, I would uh, I'd, I'd say it is the single most dangerous monopoly, um, or actually I would even say uh, rather unpopularly that it's even more dangerous than the money monopoly, uh, which a lot of people would give that title to as being the most dangerous state monopoly. And um, I also, by the way, define the state at its most basic form as being the territorial monopoly and ultimate decision making. Uh, so if it's nothing else, it is at least that. And I think that it's the most dangerous one uh, because <clears throat> It, uh, it, it makes it so that the state functions as judge, jury, and executioner, right? So, you know, you have your, uh, in many cases, even your defense attorneys working for the state, the judge is working for the state, the police officers working for the state. All these people are always working for the state. But what's more is it can say that it is going to pass a law. It'll question that law in one of its own courts. And then if it wants that law passed enough, it can use the court um, to rule its own law as just and therefore legitimate. So every every bit of um, um, every bit of the government that is is functioning in in a way that is always uh, contingent upon the state's judicial monopoly because it can always allow it to do whatever it wants to. Yeah, definitely. And uh, and when I was preparing for this uh, for preparing this outline, I, I I had a thought, and I'm sure I'm I'm sure you've seen the meme tossed around on on fascist book for uh, for any number of events. Uh, for example, a cop cleared of say, killing a citizen by an internal yeah. investigation. And I mean, would say something like, we've investigated ourselves and we found uh, we did nothing wrong. Now, right. what's, what's interesting, though, and uh, I'd like to read a couple of quotes from Anatomy of the Stakes. I think Rothbard uh, adds some, some, nice, uh, some, some nice discussion to this. But oh, sure. uh, it, dem it, demonstra it kind of demonstrates uh, uh, that function is inherent. Uh, you know, that, that, that function is inherent in the 1787 federal constitution with, uh, you know, separation of powers, even though it's not really separation of powers, especially when, you know, they, they rule on their own legitimacy uh, and, and, and their, their expansion of power. Uh, now, there's, there's an, something interesting there, too, and this is something minarchists, you know, constitutionalists don't understand. And I think Rothbard puts this, puts this uh, quite eloquently and succinctly, but, uh, you know, limited government is simply not possible. Because uh, they were talking about, uh, uh, he, he quoted uh, uh, Black, I don't remember what his first name is, I have his, uh, Professor, Professor Charles Black. And uh -huh. uh, uh, the the only possible way, like uh, uh, you you can't have like a, a private organization ruling on the constitutionality or unconstitutionality of something. It has to be part of the government, uh, which I, I I found kind of interesting. Uh, so what, what do you think? Well, yeah, no, it, it is interesting. Um, a lot of people don't realize. So you know, if if somebody's a minarchist and they want this sort of a judicial monopoly, well, then you have the state that says, okay, hey, we're going to pass this law. That law, you know, could be very blatantly unconstitutional, um, and uh, then the court can simply say, "Oh, well, no, it's not." You know, so it's completely arbitrary in that respect. So, to the extent to which you can have a limited government, it only it doesn't last very long at all. You know, it's only a matter of time until the judiciary eventually builds it up into uh, uh, 
uh, some sort of super state that we are living under today. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's definitely the case, and and it, and it's kind of funny too. Um, the uh, what do they call it? Uh, justice for hire. Uh, the Constitution is like to you know their, their derisive terminology against like you know yeah. the the private privatization of the arbitration industry. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of funny that they're so hostile towards that idea, um, but they they can't. They, well, they uh, they obviously see. I mean, you look at the the Patriot community now, and uh, they're still dealing with uh, uh, the the legal part, the legal proceedings for. Uh, their conspiracy to impede or injure officer, uh, injure officer back in last year, last January, uh, right. the occupation of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge. Uh, so I mean, they're they're very very upfront. Uh, they're they're facing uh, the, these goons directly, and uh, you know they they still want to uh, you know just just rewind it back and uh, you know uh, uh, restore uh, the law of the land, and you know uh, uh, we're a nation of laws and and all, all those uh, those phrases that they like to use. So I don't know the disconnect there is is, is definitely frustrating to say the least but uh, <laughs> uh but yeah mm -hmm. um well no i mean I, I agree with that um and you know it's also when i wrote the consequences of equality I, I don't know if i'll remember the exact statistics that i i used um but uh i think that uh, as recently as 2012 the um justice department actually reported a 93 percent conviction rate for private citizens um and uh, over the course of a seven-year study that i believe concluded in 2011 um, after over a thousand um, murders by police officers, only maybe 40 something of them were ever actually charged with manslaughter or first degree murder. And uh, of those, even less of the charges actually stuck. Yeah. 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 That's uh, <laughs> that's definitely true. They protect their own. And that's why it was, yeah. you know, uh, when Trump was running and uh, he was saying, you know, we should send Hillary to prison. And uh, uh, people actually believe that, you know, he might actually do that. Uh, and, and also the fact that, you know, the, you know, the uh, judicial system would actually, you know, charge her with that and send her to prison. That's not going to happen. They protect their own. Uh, they definitely yeah, it happened own. back in the 70s, too, with uh, Ford, right? He pardoned Nixon after the whole Watergate thing, and then everyone got all pissed off about it. But at the same time, what do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little, little naivety on, on the part of those that, uh, that actually, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, you mentioned those, those rare cases where, you know, they actually do get charged if it's uh, obscene enough or something. But, yeah, for the most part, no, they're going to they're, they're gonna walk free. And if it's a cop, they're going to get paid vacation. Uh, oh. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me read this, uh, uh, this uh, first quote that I have here in my outline from Anatomy of the State by uh, Murray Rothbard. If you haven't read it, uh, guys, uh, go check it out. It's a really, really short book. I just read it a second time. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, took me about an hour, hour and a half to, to get through. So definitely check that out. Uh, quote, all Americans familiar with the process by which the construction of limits in the Constitution has been inexorably broadened over the last century. But few have been as keen as Professor Charles Black to see that the state has in the process largely transformed judicial review itself from a limiting device to yet another instrument for furnishing ideological legitimacy to the government's actions. For if a judicial degree of decree of unconstitutional is a mighty check to government power, an implicit or explicit verdict of constitutional is a mighty weapon for fostering public acceptance of ever greater government power. Uh, end quote. Now, uh, let me see if there's any other. I've got a few quotes here, but we've got plenty to talk about tonight. Uh, sure. But yeah, I guess for, from Rothbard's analysis, uh, uh, do, you have, do you have any any other thoughts on that? Uh, well, you know, I think Rothbard is just brilliant, and uh, much of the most um, uh, prolific critiques of the state uh, that I use today that, um, you know, many modern libertarians use um, really do stem from Rothbard's work and anatomy of the state, I agree, is a great resource. <clears throat> now, uh, I would also say that much of what Rothbard's talking about there, if you really think through it logically, you know, you sort of just have to wake up to the situation you're in, which is that the state does run the judiciary, they do run law enforcement, they do run all of these kinds of things. And you should be able to, you know, fairly adequately reason to that kind of a conclusion, right? Um, you know, if if you wanted to sue Coca-Cola, you probably wouldn't feel comfortable doing it in one of their own courts, you know, if they had one. <laughs> True, so, yeah. You know, so it just as soon as you realize that it's, it's no different, in fact, sometimes even, uh, actually quite often even worse when you apply that same thing to the state, um, then these conclusions, though, they sort of just follow. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, so, uh, 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 any closing thoughts on that or can we move forward to, uh, uh, ethical consequences? Uh, okay, let's move on forward. Cool. Cool. Okay. So, uh, and this is probably one of my favorite sections because, uh, I, I I've noticed, uh, and this will kind of tie really in nice, uh, tie in nicely to, you know, the, the rest of our discussion, but, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've kind of, I've noticed this firsthand, uh, uh, you know, from, from going to, uh, to college and things. And it's, uh, it's really, uh, 
Uh, it's really <laughs> not. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Uh, right. So yeah, it was definitely one of my favorite se- uh, favorite sections. Uh, so when societies progressively become more and more egalitarian, what impact does that have? You know, on you know the ethics of of society. Well, in order for um, ethics to be uh, universalized, there has to be some sort of universal good, and that you know we can dispute the the origin of that. You know, if someone's religious, they may say it comes from God, or you know, Hoppe says in um in um the economics and ethics of private property you know talked about argumentation ethics i think we talked about that last time Mm -hmm. um but nonetheless um moral relativism is something that comes out of this uh, desire for equality and the the reason it does is um because it, it needs to be able to accommodate all sorts of um ethical systems ethical views so you can't really say that one person is you know necessarily um um, better, more uh, morally speaking, uh, where you can't say that one moral system is superior to another. Um, and uh, for this reason, you're going to have that kind of uh, moral relativism and that sort of moral decay in any society that embraces equality to the extent in which um, much of the Western world has. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, definitely, uh, that's definitely a good way to put it. But yeah, right and wrong have right and wrong, you know, good and evil, like a, you know, the, the those sorts of moral and immoral. Uh, they've definitely become obfuscated, and I think that's you know largely due uh, to the majority of individuals, you know, belief in the legitimacy legit, legitimacy of governments. I mean, they come out with uh, you know these these victimless crime laws, and because government deems these things illegal, uh, people right. you know just automatically, uh, I mean, statists, you know, the the believers and believers in the state, you know, kind of just jump to the conclusion that okay, well, that must be immoral. Uh, right. And that's a, there's de- definitely a, a problem with that. Uh, oh, sure. Def- definitely sure. a problem. Uh, you know, um, what, what's interesting, too, about um, relativism in the state and whatnot is it's precisely because the um, state can dictate what's legal and illegal, right, by definition, it's able to do that. Um, and, and that is therefore subject to change. You know, I mean, like you can, the law can change all the time, at least the legally speaking can change. So it, it is relative when uh, you think of it in terms of illegal and legal and rather than wrong and right. Uh, and that becomes very pervasive when the state really begins to dominate every aspect of life, which it does. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and, and I guess one, one other, I guess, uh, uh, furtherance of that is, you know, uh, it's not immoral or wrong to, you know, rightfully own a lot of property. Uh, but uh, but these folks would, would 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 have you believe otherwise. They they want you to believe otherwise. Right. Uh, and and obviously back like I, I, there are a lot of issues, a lot of issues uh, with you know the 17 federal constitution. But you know one of one of like the the main tenets that you know the uh, the founding fathers I like that terminology. But uh, they, they they did con- they did believe in private property. I mean yeah they were socialist uh, socialist life. But uh, that that was kind of something that was you know ingrained in the and in the, in, I guess the, the spirit of the of the constitution so to speak. But uh, you know as uh, you know you know society progressed and uh, became more more egalitarian. Uh, I mean that's uh, that definitely the, 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 I guess the uh, position that the, the state has held is it's obviously changed with with uh, the oh. increased the increased the ever increasing expropriation of you know private property through taxation and, and other measures. Uh, private property is inherent to, inherently anti-egalitarian too because at some point you have to realize it's rooted in scarcity nothing can be privatized if there's no scarcity element to it and uh, for then to someone own a part of re- a resource whether it be land or money or some sort of good or service or commodity uh, that's scarce they must uh, then say that I have this but somebody else may not be able to have this same amount so it's uh, really not good for somebody who wants to push this kind of equality agenda. Uh, it really just uh, con- contradicts completely. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You know, I I hadn't really thought of that that way. Yeah. Private property is inherently anti-egalitarian. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, that that explains it. <laughs> that definitely explains it. Uh, and and you you quote uh, Frederick Bastiat in your book, and I really think uh, this is a, a, a terrific quote. Uh, quote: When law and morality co- contradict each other, the citizen has the cruel alternative of either losing his moral sense or losing his respect uh, for the law. End quote. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, I guess uh, that's it's quite telling, and, and yeah, it is an, an, an accurate statement. And I, I, I do have some involvement, uh, very very little, but uh, I do have a, a couple of colleagues that are you know constitutionalists. But uh, uh, I mean, yeah, the the rule of law, we're a nation of laws, uh, all of that stuff. I mean, they're they're never going to lose their respect for the law, you know, unless they you know come to the good side of of uh, yeah. <laughs> of proprietary anarchism. But uh, but yeah, that's that's that that's definitely accurate. It's definitely accurate.
Yeah, even then, too, more people in the in the Bastiat quote, at least, they're likely to choose the uh, former, which is to lose their own sense of right and wrong, just because you can do that in a state of society and not go to jail or get shot by the police or, you know, have to pay a fine. But if you if you lose your respect for the law, well, that could cause you to do things that you may be uh, not uh, permissible by the state's guidelines. Yeah, that yeah. that. And if and, and if uh, these folks dismiss, you know, the respect for the law. I mean, uh-huh. that that's kind of foundational upon their ideology. So they obviously can't like it's not even an option at that point. It's, a, you know, well, just, of just, course, just, just um, morality. of course, even in, in the book, I, I think in the ethics chapter, I even I even said uh, that uh, what people consider laws, at least the political laws, you know, I would I'd hesitate to call them laws in any way other than the colloquial sense. Uh, I would say legislation, um, which I would identify then as the perversion of law. Because uh, legislation doesn't have to adhere to what is the actual natural law. You can pass legislation that perverts it, and so they so often do. Yeah, and and you made you made a, a good observation there. You you, you mentioned, uh, uh, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, you mentioned that like uh, when it goes from maybe natural law to fiat law, there really is no there really is no such thing as law. Could could you could you kind of speak to that a little more? Yeah, well, I mean, you're always going to have. Um, law in some sense because a law is something that i believe you don't need to enforce like uh to make a to be somewhat kantian in my approach here to you know physical law um you know you, you throw something up in the air and it comes down again uh that's the law of gravity you don't need to enforce it it just happens um so in order to have uh these laws or policies or legislation that's created by the state uh those require enforcement they're they're unnatural laws they're laws that people really need to get people to abide by one way or the other. And uh, that is what I call fiat law. It's um, just pieces of paper that say things that may be right, may be wrong, incidentally, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Um, so that's 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 all I have in my in my outline for the ethical consequences section, but uh, is it, be it any, any closing thoughts on that? Um, well, um, you know, I think that this is something that's incredibly important. Um, and... Uh, I, unfortunately, I didn't spend enough time. I thought there was the, the shortest chapter, the shortest main chapter in the book was the ethics chapter. Uh, I guess just because I, I didn't feel like there was a, a whole lot that I needed to discuss, seeing as uh, trying to convince people that it's probably not right to have you know a gang of thieves roaming around marauding and robbing and pillaging the population is a bad thing, right? But you still need to really see the importance of this. So we get bogged down and we have the economics and we got some cultural stuff, but you know, if you're talking about right and wrong and you actually can be morally objective, then the support for the state should just evaporate and wither away immediately. Uh, so that's something that I really would like a lot of people to pay more attention to than they're doing now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. And, and yeah, the, the ethics is important. The, the ethics is definitely important, uh, mm-hmm. especially with, I mean, yeah, just something inherent in the Constitution. Again, taxation, uh, you know, legalized theft. Uh, for some reason, that's, uh, you know, moral and right. But, uh, you know, uh, I can't go over to your house and steal your shit. Uh, or, right. or I I wouldn't. Uh, but, yeah, I, I would get in trouble for that. So uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it also kind of leads into, like, the, the deification of the state. You know, the, the transferring of right, right. I don't really like the word rights, but I'll just go ahead and use it for the sake of... Sure. Expediency here, uh, delegating rights to uh, this entity that no one else, no one else has. Uh, so well, I think yeah, that I kind of it. aligns with the ethics as well, too. Yeah, I said in the book too. You have people end up with two different moral standards, right? There's one for the state and one for everybody else. Um, if yeah. you remember that part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true, and you know, it's it's, uh, it's led to uh, some 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 dangerous consequences. So, uh, so I guess in it, like I guess just moving forward. Uh, Kind of into uh, you know moral moral relativism and equality more generally, and I kind of want to provide some of uh, my uh, <laughs> my experiences here. But uh, uh, I'll start with uh, start with this. But thankfully, I won't be going back to college, uh, so I don't have to deal with this shit anymore. Uh, most <laughs> it was the most it was the most frustrating, yeah, one of the most frustrating things, especially like in the in my philosophy classes. So I love philosophy, and they when I when I, I've loved philosophy, but when I'd go into those classes, I I'd hate it. Uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, it's probably, yeah, probably the most frustrating aspect about college. And, uh, uh, yeah, I'm right there with you. And in, in one of my articles published in April of 2016, uh, I made the, it was actually, uh, the, the article was titled, Why Are Most Millennials Socialists? 
And uh, and one of one of my uh, claims was that moral relativism is widespread within college campuses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guess the only difference being my mine was only like a two paragraph uh, section. You know, I'll try to keep my articles short so people actually read them. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you laid it out far more eloquently, and uh, and you went in, into a lot more depth than I did. So uh, so uh, you mentioned you're going to George Mason. Uh, have you uh, have you observed any of um, you know this moral moral relativism on on, on uh, in your college experience? Well, you know, I should I should have uh, stated before I haven't actually started George Mason yet. I I'm, I'm a transfer student. Um, I'm enrolled now. But my first classes there will start with me as a junior <clears throat> on the 23rd of this month. Um, so there, um, no, I, I just haven't been on the campus. Uh, so that's that's the reason why. Although as an econ student, um, their econ department is pretty legit. You know, um, they've got some uh, very good professors there: Brian Kaplan, Walter Williams. Um, Rustici uh, that are that are very good on these things and they also have the Mercatus Center too which has published some really great research um, that uh, I think uh, anyone who wants to um, test policy or see the results of um, certain studies they've conducted uh, they, they do great work there now in community college though where I've been for the past couple of years yeah a little bit but honestly like people who go to community college they just don't give a shit you know so I, I just don't think that people are um, uh, really uh, as likely to be that way or at least make it as obvious on, uh, on a community college campus as they are on a four-year campus because we're all just trying to show up, get the class done, go home, and then get our associate's degree and move on with our lives. So yeah, maybe a little bit, but it, it was never really that bad. I think that's just a consequence of me being a community college, not an actual four-year institution yet. Yeah, and and see mine, I, and I think I probably mentioned this in that in that first in that first interview, but yeah, mine was completely opposite. Uh, I mean, the the, the the community college I went to, uh, especially uh, especially my uh, I guess my philosophy classes last semester, and then also sociology. Well, actually, no, that was not not my philosophy classes last semester, but uh, uh, sociology and Amer American politics and government specifically. Uh, I saw quite a bit of that uh this sort of thing uh, the uh, moral relativism uh in those classes and i wrote up a bunch of reports on on all of the, the the terrible things that i saw and the advocacy for communism and and all of those things sociology was definitely worse that lady was a monster uh, uh, sociology <laughs> i mean that's yeah absolutely um but uh you know in my experience with the sociology class again we probably talked about this in the last interview that we did uh my professor that I had, um, he was probably a leftist, um, but uh, I, th I thought that he was actually refreshingly objective um, in his approach to teaching. Because yeah, he would teach all the, you know, here's the hierarchy, patriarchy kind of stuff, but he would teach it in the way that he's like, okay, this is a branch of sociology called conflict theory, and here's what they believe. And then he would move on to something else, you know, and then not talk about that anymore. So it was just for the sake of getting definitions down for the field. Um, and I didn't really have much of a problem with that at all. So, um, but I, I'm pretty sure that's a minority experience. I think I just got lucky there. Yeah, I would, I would, <laughs> I would, I would say, I would say you did. Yeah, there was just so much stuff. Uh, one of one of the most, I guess, one of the one of the most uh, ridiculous ones was uh, I don't remember what section of the class it was on, but uh, she had uh, uh, all of the uh, all of the uh, people who identify as male sit on one side of the room, and all the oh my God. females sit on the other side of the room. And uh, uh, the the uh, the females the the uh, the the females would say like uh, why uh, uh, why things are so hard for women and, and the the guys would you know would, would do the same thing and the, the women were like uh, well we are, we're always expected to look pretty um, we have to pay for birth control we have to do all of these things and then uh, and it was kind of like this was the only time I really like talked to people in that class but uh, they're like okay what should we put on there guys and I was like uh, okay well something bad for men they lose most of the time in divorce courts. Uh, the women get most of the settlements uh, uh, in divorces, uh, like just like really terrible shit. And the the things oh, yeah. the, fem the females are saying, we're just like we are expected to look pretty. It's like okay, yeah. <laughs> well. okay, don't don't forget how many of us die in warfare compared to them, um, yeah. and uh, die on the job too. So yeah, th there's no contest there. This is one of the reasons why I'm going to be talking about feminism in my book. Um, now, however, I will say that uh, feminism is something that. Uh, Thankfully, it's dying out outside of college campuses. It really hardly exists anymore. Uh, some people still use the term because they think it's trendy, um, but what they'll say now is, you know, feminism, it's about equality of, of sexes and whatnot, and of course that's bullshit. Um, but in the United States, 80-something percent of people say that they believe in um, equality of the sexes and um, only about 
you know, 13% or so actually call themselves feminists. Um, in the UK, it's about 7% that call themselves feminists, but over 90% believe in equality of the sexes. So their, their whole banter, their definitions, their that whole whatever thing they're going down, it, people don't buy it anymore. And uh, I think that we're going to finally see the end of that ridiculous ideology. Oh, I, I, I definitely, I definitely hope yeah. so. I definitely hope so. Uh, but let me, let me get your thoughts since we're on the subject of, of, of feminism here. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, you know, uh, the first wave feminism versus like, uh, you know, the, the third wave fem feminism that's kind of leading to its dying out, I would say. Well, I mean, I'd consider myself a first wave feminist because a first wave feminist would just say, hey, you should, women should be able to own property. And I totally agree with that. Um, and that was one of the main rights that first wave feminists fought for. Um, after that, then it got into the legal stuff, right? Like suffrage, and then now we're getting into this whole like, oh, we're expected to look pretty bullshit. Um, so I, I definitely think that um, the third wave feminists are uh, actually a huge asset to us because they're turning people away from this disgusting, hating ideology. Yeah, yeah, I, I <laughs> yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I would definitely agree. I would definitely agree. So um, I, I guess uh, I want to read a, a, and this will this time really nicely. I'll start with a quote from a book we were required to read in my uh, what philosophy class was it? Uh, it was uh, just I don't remember. Oh, the it was, it was an ethics class. I don't remember the exact class, but it was an ethics class. Uh, and the book was called Whatever Happened to Good and Evil by uh, Russ Schaefer Landau. Uh, he, he's an ethical objectivist. Uh, and yeah, one, one other thing I noticed is they, the, the, I guess the academia version of philosophy uses uh, like slightly different, uh, you know, terminology than the Austrian, you know, philosophers do. Uh, but anyways, uh, quotes, uh, yeah, he says, quote, ask any ethics professor nowadays and you're bound to get the same report. Most students regard moral skepticism as the default position in ethics and abandon their view, if, if at all, only very begrudgingly, end quote. Now, I think that's quite telling, uh, and it comes from someone who, you know, would know. Uh, he's the uh, director of the Parr Center for Ethics at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, you know, this is this is something I, I experienced last semester. It was in my epistemology, epistemology and you know metaphysics, epistemology class, epistemology and metaphysics, physics, I think it was. But uh, uh, yeah, the the teacher basically like sat down. It was like the first day of class, and he said, "Yeah, we can't know anything." I was like, "Well, that's kind of disconcerting." Sure. And most of most of the most of the uh, most of the uh, class kind of you know tacitly agreed with him uh, at least to some extent and my, my first thought was you know if, if you really uh if you really believe that then why the hell are you wasting time teaching this class yeah uh, what, what, what are you getting out of this what are you getting out of this did you ever ask him how he knew that <laughs> no no i i, I didn't i should have i should have challenged him on that but i don't know yeah. I, I i tried when i was at the at the community college i i participated i participated as much as i could like i actually like you know put forth some effort and you know trying to bring some things to light but the response was just so negative, and like there was no discussion that sparked like that sparked out of it. Like I was oh, hoping. Oh yeah. So I just, oh, I just kind God. of gave up. <laughs> I I had a professor um, this past semester. I think I told you about this actually, um, where I uh, I had the audacity to to challenge the um, claim that um, transsexuality was you know a totally legitimate, um, not a mental disorder at all. You know all the, and anyway, the professor, you know, rather than actually like defining a term for me, which I was asking for um, uh, how she would define certain terms to come to this conclusion, instead of you know even engaging in a, a slight like two minute long discussion to appease my curiosity, uh, she quite literally threw her hands up in the air and said, "I'm not comfortable talking about this. You're making me upset," and then just didn't want to talk about it anymore. Uh, wow. So I think that's sort of you know something that was very disheartening for me because i'm like this is an academic learning environment so to speak right theoretically at least and i, I can't even you know propose propose a somewhat provocative question that has a good point behind it because i think i did have a good point and uh yeah I, I i could i could that was really the only instance at community college where i sort of felt on par with all of that kind of stuff and it was just horrible yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I definitely agree, and that was like I obviously were, were I, at least I was told. I'm not gonna you know try to uh, speak for anyone else here, but uh, I was always told, and uh, like uh, whether it was by like you know media commercials or like my parents, you know that like college is like you know this like really like intellectual academic environment. It's not, nice. and, and and yeah, yeah, exactly, and that's why <laughs> it's nice. I was. I was, I was talking to my, my parents about this, and I was like, you know, it's not it's not challenging, uh, it's not intellectual at all. It's 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 yeah, I, I I'm I'm not I'm not enjoying this at all. It's the biggest scam they've got going, Shane. Like what they do is they'll just they're just selling you this piece of paper that employers apparently put way too much um, emphasis on, and uh, then what they do is they lower standards progressively, so you need another piece of paper, 
and then you need another piece of paper. And all the while you're wasting time, not working, not getting experience, and you're paying them thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that was that was my main. And I haven't actually announced this on uh, on the radio, so this will be kind of a little exclusive. But, but yeah, I'm not going to college anymore. Like I, I, I realized I, I a year ago when I was going to like uh, Illinois State University, the actual like university. I, uh, you know, I was like, damn it, I wish I wouldn't have wasted all this time. I wish I'd just gone to do a trade, like, you know, like HVAC or electrician or something, because, you know, for a lot of those, you can get paid in, you, during your training. And I've had a really hard time finding a job with my, like, five day a week class schedule. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, now I'm, I'm, I'm switching to uh, a trade after wasting all that damn time in, in college, which is frustrating. But I'll tell you what, class started on Monday, and uh, I didn't go. So it felt really, really nice there. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, Let's see. Okay, yeah. Uh, one one final point here, and then uh, um, to I guess the, the final couple of, of, of topics here. But uh, uh, I want to make this point and get your thoughts on it. Something I've I've, I've thought about uh, quite a bit, um, and I think it could explain why college students are you know the way they are. But it can also expand to the political left and right as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I think the major aspect at play here uh, with you know moral relativism and, and and all that all that stuff is you know lack of a consistent philosophical grounding. Uh, you know without that individuals are likely to sway with the winds of political expediency. Uh, now couple that with you know the belief that uh, college college is a place to find yourself. Uh, you know <laughs> as well as uh, you know the as uh, I've, I mentioned at least a couple instances of you know relativism within college. And, uh, you know, the, the, the rational activities, uh, events and protests, you know, that, that have been happening at colleges, I think it kind of, I think they kind of make more and more sense when you, when you look at it from that way, just a lack of a consistent philosophical grounding. Right. No, what, I agree. What, what I agree completely. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, you, it, it has a lot to do, I think, with um, uh, just this, the, the, the uh, environment that the generation's grown up under, too, you know, I mean, um, and I, I'm totally pro-technology and everything, but I'm definitely going to say it, it, it makes things, uh, I think the environment that people grow up under when you can just hey, get whatever you want by clicking a button, uh, you know, sometimes that could influence how people see the world. Um, and uh, sometimes when they they don't um, get what they think they deserve or things don't go their way, it uh, has more of an effect on them personally. Uh, than they otherwise, um, or than it otherwise would have, was a prior gener uh, generation. Not only that, but now you have these uh, college safe spaces. So any mm -hmm. um, any outside opinion that they don't like uh, is just you know blocked off, so they don't have to hear it. And then when they do have to hear it, it's like a like a red alert kind of thing in their head, right? And it goes crazy. Uh, yeah. So yeah. just uh, I think it's a combination of environmental stuff and uh, how schools are structured these days and really the kind of people they're putting in these schools in the first place, you know. Uh, it's also very political too, right? I mean, like nobody wants to get sued. So uh, if, if the school doesn't give in to what somebody wants just because they happen to be gay, then, you know, they might get sued. So they have to, you know, do bend over backwards for every little stupid, you know. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, yeah, especially with the internet, with the internet aspect. I mean, instant gratification. Uh, right, right. <laughs> rather than, you know, uh, uh, rather than, you know, have like, it, it it kind of yeah, especially like the the younger I mean the younger generation that's kind of grown up with this technology. I think that can you know have some sort of a psychological impact on yeah. uh, kind of as as you said how they how they view the world. Yeah, and also so. uh, parents, um, you know what they'll do. I mean, I'm not a parent. So I don't want to critique anyone's parenting, but I mean it, it would stand to reason for me that uh, you know if you you know you tell your kid you know oh, you're so special, you're like this, you're like that, and you know you can do anything. In reality. You know, you don't really get a trophy for coming in last, right? You don't get a raise because you didn't do your job. Uh, you don't, um, you're really not all that special. There's a bunch of people that could replace you in your job. Uh, all this kind of stuff, it's really not, it's really just not true when they're told that their whole lives. And, you know, that's not the reality. Yeah, that's 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 definitely a good point too. That really is. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, good good deal. Good deal. So, um, along the, along the same lines, and this is kind of the the cultural aspect, but I it, it ties in uh, uh, very very well. Uh, but she mentioned uh, music and art in your book, which you know yeah. I didn't really expect that, but uh, at the same time, you know, it was, it was good to see it in there. Um, but uh, I'd like to read a, a, a quick quote from your book, and then we can uh, we can discuss further. Quote: Under socialism, under democracy, and in a culture of equality. Garbage is indistinguishable from art, noise from music, even men from women. Words do not have definitions. They mean only what the politician using them wants them to mean at that particular time. Everything blurs together into a senseless society where that which exists and is might not exist or may not be at all. It is the greatest imagination of Immanuel Kant uh, made real. End quote. Uh, so, uh, 
So you, you then go on to mention, you know, the deterioration of art, music, architecture, and human beings, uh, but, you know, a little more detail, uh, which I definitely agree with. I've been, <laughs> uh, I'm a metalhead, but we'll, we'll get to that here in a moment. But yeah, most, most, uh, most of that stuff is just, it's just shit nowadays. But uh, uh, what roles uh, do these uh, quality freaks have, uh, have on art and, uh, you know, music? Uh, <clears throat> well, um, you, you know, people tend to, to make art out of what is popular at the time. Um, Renaissance art, you know, was very heavy, heavy on um, religion, right? Um, now we have a new obsession. That new obsession is equality. Everything's got to be the same. Everything's got to be equal, right? Um, and it's not so obvious, right? Because how do you really paint that? You know, how do you sculpt that? Well, you can't really do it just by painting Jesus Christ like you could have done in, you know, the 1500s or whatever. So what we have now is this modern art, or sometimes you know, it's called the people's art even. And uh, it's it's incredibly egalitarian. Um, and the reason is because anyone can do it, you know. Uh, anyone uh, can reproduce uh, some of the most um, um, highly valued pieces of modern art, uh, sometimes uh, even perfectly authentically. And... Uh, so, you know, there have been instances where at modern art museums, a uh, custodian cleaned up the display because he thought it was garbage. And I'll tell you what, those people ought to get a raise. The only ones doing their jobs <laughs> around there. <laughs> so are, are you kind of like, are you kind of talking about, I've, I've seen this in, in TV shows and such, but like where like an artist just like, you know, grabs like a few paintbrushes and just like splashes the paint onto like the paper and then. Yeah, like, well, oh I, sometimes, it's, <laughs> that's, sometimes that's it's not even, even that, uh, sometimes that that's a little too complimentary. Um, there's pieces of art where it's literally broken wine bottles sitting on the floor. Um, you know, I've done that some mornings and I was very hungover. I produced this same piece of art. Um, there, there have been, um, ones where it's just clothes hung over a podium. Uh, and, and, you know, it's valued at like $500,000. And like, how is that possible? Jesus. Well, well it, the reason is because it is what people want now. They don't want to see a hierarchy to these kinds of things. They want it to be something that everybody can do, that everybody can be just as good at. And that is modern art, unquestionably. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's, you know, I, I haven't really thought of that way. And I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't think a lot of other people really have, really have either. Uh, Cause you know, like the, the art aspect kind of, you know, it, it kind of seems lower priority than, you know, like the, uh, uh, the the uh, laws that uh, that these people try to push uh, uh, through push through the state. Uh, but but what about uh, but what about I, I like to get your thoughts on on music. Uh, uh -huh. What what has you know egalitarianism done to uh, music? I know the answer to that, but I want to hear you, to, yeah. hear you talk about it. Well, um, you know sometimes we'll have this thing called free jazz, which is you know modern art in musical form. You know it's no rhythm to it at all. There's no uh, technical ability on the instrument required whatsoever. But people will lead it up. Um, in fact, there, there's even a piece of music um, by a guy named John Cage, and it's a it's called 433. Have you ever heard of that piece, Shane? I have not. No. Okay, so um, I would love to have everybody listening to this also listen to that piece. So um, all it is is four minutes and 33 seconds of total silence. That's it. Uh, just rests on the page. But the, the the person who is performing it, they're still counting the beats. They're still turning the page, and theoretically, the music is supposed to be. You know, you hear the cars outside, you hear the air conditioning turn on, you, you know, you hear someone cough in the audience and that, that's the music. Well, no, it's not the music. That's just the noise that we get in our day-to-day -day lives that are just incidental to everything else. Um, but still, that passes as music these days. The video of it online has, you know, hundreds of thousands of views, um, lots of likes, too. Uh, you got to wonder why. Well, can any of us do that? Do you need to be a musician to perform this piece? Of course not. Well, that's why people like it. <laughs> and who is that by? John Cage. John Cage. Yes. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll set that in in the introduction, uh, in the introduction to this, uh, in the introduction to this podcast. Uh, give the give the uh, listeners a, a a little introduction to uh, to his music. Uh, <laughs> but uh, wow, I yeah, I'd never heard of that, and and people actually enjoy that. Oh huh. yes, people wow. pay for it. Unreal. I mean, just like you know, sit in your living room. Come on. Yeah. Well, you know, also um, there's a, an art museum that opened up recently where all of the um, all of the art it's blank canvases, and you're supposed to imagine the art, and people pay the damn cover to get in there. Oh my god. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's real. It's very, very real. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, um, now uh, I in our last conversation, one of our last conversations on on fascist book, uh, 
Uh, I mentioned to you that I was a metalhead and that you uh, released an instrumental metal album in, in high school. Yeah. Uh, good, yeah, good stuff, by the way. Uh, Thanks. But, uh, but I, I guess uh, I'd like to get your thoughts. Uh, uh, do, you, do you follow the, uh, you know, the modern metal scene today? Um, not as much as I used to. Um, I, I mean, I'm somewhat up to date with who's still touring, who's not. You know, if a major band that I'm into gets a new member or something like happens like that, then I'm, I'm usually up to date with things like that. But uh, not at all to the extent in which somebody who's really heavily into that stuff is. Uh, I kind of just see it in passing nowadays. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so I mean, uh, have you, I guess, uh, seen metal be influenced by you know egalitarianism uh, over you know the the past the past few years or so? Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, it's it's not quite as obvious because for something to be metal and you know, I mean there has to be certain things about it right I mean they need to follow some sort of criteria in order to call it that um, but uh, yeah I mean um, based on what I know uh, a lot of bands out there now what they'll do is they'll get a guitar and it has like eight or nine strings on it and then they'll just bang on the lowest one um, and uh, they do that for four minutes and then somebody yells something over it, and then that's the song you know and then they do that 12 times and they have an album Right. So yeah. um, that's that's uh, definitely a way in which I'm seeing that happen, um, but uh, not at all to the extent in which it is happening in more pop culture music and in um, contemporary jazz style music. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is like I, I've been into metal for about probably five, five or six years, I would say. And mm -hmm. uh, and this is this has been something I've noticed. Um, I, I've noticed since then, uh, but yeah, like the a lot of like the bigger metalcore bands, you know, or or even like yeah, maybe even post hardcore too, which is different styles of metal for those who aren't familiar with with the genre. But uh, a, a lot of like yeah, a lot of it's uh, extremely, extremely, extremely simple, uh, and the guitars are uh, essentially just like open notes and breakdowns. Right. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if that if that like is is you know uh, I guess kind of a uh, uh, something stemming from the. Uh, the egalitarian thing, or if it's, or if just people's tastes nowadays are just so basic that, uh, you know, they just kind of manipulate that and, you know, not have to, you know, yeah. actually produce any, like, good music. Well, sometimes I think that uh, certain kinds of music are kept honest by the people that uh, tend to, you know, be longer term fans of it. So, you know, there's still going to be a crowd at Tosin Abbasi's next show, right? Um, so, so things like that, because people also play the instruments and uh, it, it's a sort of, uh, it's a check. I guess, in a way. Not a perfect one, obviously. We see these things like you're talking about happening, um, but it, it is also keeping it from um, happening to the extent to which it's happening in other genres. Yeah, yeah, and, and metal is metal is really, really decentralized. Like you know, as as like compared, especially compared to like the mainstream music industry. Oh, sure. Uh, it's extremely decentralized. Like I, I interviewed, uh, I've interviewed probably three or four uh, um, metal artists from from uh, from various bands. King Conquer, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, um, <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, a lot of them are just you know they're all DIYers. They just produce all their own stuff, and right. uh, and there's there's no major label dictating to them what they can talk about or what the music must sound like. Uh, but but yeah, unfortunately there is uh, uh, I think like especially for for some for some of the bands and, and some of their songs, uh, there real there there definitely is you know that that collectivistic uh, kind of new agey type uh, you know style to the lyrics. So if 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 not for the like the the instruments specifically. Uh, I think it's definitely having an impact on, you know, uh, the lyrics for, for some of these bands. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely it is. Uh, I think lyrical quality has really gone down um, more so than um, really much else in the music industry, at least in terms of metal. Um, now, granted, most of the metal I listen to is uh, instrumental metal, so I, I'm probably not the best resource on that. Um, but from what I have heard, it's absolutely true what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, and, and granted, there are, and, and this is this is why I, I this is why I I mean I, I really can't stand any other genre of music. I mean I like some acoustic stuff because I mean yeah there is some some, some talent uh, some, sure. some talent there, uh, and classic rock I I just you know like pretty much anything rock like that I, I like, but uh, um, yeah I, I fell in love with metal just kind of based off of, like the technicality, uh, even if the even if the lyrics are shit. <laughs> Uh, and you know, uh, socialistic, and in, in, in some sense, I can still enjoy the song because you know the, the instruments might be good. And with other genres, you know, like uh, uh, like mainstream pop or something, no, the the background's garbage, and you know, uh, the, the the sound is all engineered anyways, the vocals and all. Yeah, so. Ingve Malmsteen talked about that in an inter interview once, where he was saying, um, you know, he thought that uh, you know his favorite band was uh, Deep Purple, growing up in the seventies, and he's like, oh, yeah, the lyrics are shit, but at the you know, it's uh, it's a good song. You know, you enjoy it. <laughs> it's like that's yeah, true. You know, uh, you can still find something to like about the, the that kind of music. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I, I think that's 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 what's going to uh, you know uh, keep metal around as it as oh. it is, and I I, I I don't have any doubts about that. I mean, everyone's uh, there. There's so many underground bands and stuff that just do it for fun. So I'm right. not worried about metal ever, you know, uh, dying away. Yeah, are there are they're gonna continue to be shit bad bands that have no talent whatsoever? Yeah, for sure, for sure. But I don't pay attention to them anyways. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. So any any closing thoughts on you know uh, uh, you know music inequality uh, or anything like that because not, I think the conversation is going to get interesting. Uh, well, not yeah, that it yeah. hasn't already, but one um, one thing we I just want to touch on real quick is uh, actually infrastructure um, as well because I did talk about that in this chapter and uh, it, it's worth explaining I think if we have the time uh, how the equality agenda also deteriorates infrastructure in addition to art and music. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so um, what happens is, um, well, it, it's sort of similar in, in the way that modern art exists, right? So you don't want to make the building uh, architecturally appeasing, right? Any building can be beautiful, right? Anyone can build this building. Um, but I think that's a, a more minor um, factor here, and uh, rather it's more economic in, in this sense. So when you have infrastructure, um, this is these are some these are assets to people, right? A house, for example. Um, now, when you're living under a democracy uh, or in, in a socialistic um, uh, economy, uh, really any kind of status system, especially if you have a central bank, um, well, you're going to have very short-sighted politicians. You're going to have a lot of inflation. You're going to have a big debt culture, right? Because uh, you know, democracy, it's short-sighted. Um, you know, no accountability. The central bank uh, printing away purchasing power um, constantly drilling the uh, country into debt and people in that kind of an environment where their money is going to be worth next worth less the next year um, and they, they don't know what's going to happen to the economy with all the financial uncertainty they really want their assets to be very liquid in case you need to sell it on the market in case of financial um, distress and you, there's really no incentive to build um, a very ar architecturally pleasing home uh, because it, it's harder to fit to somebody's taste. It may be more difficult to sell on the market if you ever needed to. So that's why houses then deteriorate to this typical, you know, Blue's Clues kind of house with the square and the, the yeah. triangle roof on top because it's just, it's vanilla ice cream. You know, anyone will eat it um, and it goes with a lot of different things. Uh, so there's an incentive to build things like that. You know, you see these neighborhoods where every house is sort of like a cookie cutter of the last house. Um, uh -huh. down these rows and the bushes are trimmed to a certain way. I mean, and it's just disgusting. You know, there's there's no culture to it at all. And uh, that is totally, absolutely a um, byproduct of uh, democratic uh, socialistic policies. Yeah, 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 definitely. And just a question before I, I, I sure. provide one of one of my comments: Are you like, are, have, have other have other you know uh, economists and philosophers talked about this? Talked about that subject because I've never heard that brought up before. Yeah. Um, there was a, a, a talk by um, Guido Hilsman at um, Property and Freedom Society 2015. Uh, it was the one I attended, and um, I he he gives um, he he talks about this infrastructure a little bit. And there is a article, um, actually, actually an interview on the Mises Institute's website, Mises.org, with Hans Hermann Hoppe. It's called "The Logical Beauty of Libertarianism," where he talks about the art and music aspect. Awesome, awesome, very good. But but yeah, I, I, you're you're exactly right. I mean the the, the subdivision I'm in mean, now, like yeah, the houses are identical. I mean they may be like you know mirrored and mirrored, but the, everything else is just just uh, just identical. And then uh, and then also too, um, there was uh, I, I've lived in like eight different states. I moved like pretty much every four years of my life until like eight years ago. Whenever you know I. Uh, been living in Bloomington ever since, but uh, there was one. There was one one time, and you know, like the ten plus houses I've lived in, where there, there was actually there was actually kind of different. And it was, you know, it was uh, um, a little like more a little more of a higher end neighborhood, and the houses were just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, when it, once you bought those houses, they were hard to sell. Oh yeah, uh, they were really really hard to sell. I mean, yeah, everyone. I mean, they loved that they loved them. People, some people probably could afford them, but uh, but yeah, this, those, some of those houses would be on the market for two or three years. Absolutely. And you know, and then the the people would move out of the house, and they'd they'd they'd, they'd own two houses. Uh, and the property taxes were not cheap there, so uh, it's I, I I think you're you're exactly spot on uh, with you know the the basic. I mean, if it's basic, it works. You can get rid of it pretty easily. Uh, that's that's definitely kind of an advantage, uh, a, a, an advantage for some nowadays. Definitely, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, any uh, anything else on that, or uh, uh, I think move we're on good. To where... Let's uh, let's get going. Let's keep going. Okay. 
All right, so <laughs> I was here for for for, for a, a disagreement on action. So so this will be uh, this will be interesting. Uh, so you mentioned in the conclusion of uh, the consequences of equality that uh, quote people today must very importantly support all secession movements end quote. Uh, can you elaborate on why that is? Well, definitely I can do that. So I think that secession is extremely important, um, and the reason, the main reason I believe this, is because secession it makes every other strategy for bringing about um, a libertarian more feasible, right? If you want to do what you do, if you want to maybe do what Cal Moline is doing with Liberate, R Liberate RVA, um, go and actually engage people and talk to those people and convince them of, you know, X, Y, or Z being true rather than A, B, and C, and therefore they should be an anarchist or they should be a libertarian or whatever. Well, that's great, but I'll tell you what, it, your job is going to be a bloody hell of a lot easier if the uh, group that you're addressing with this is maybe a third the size if it otherwise was or half the size, or if it's one person a day instead of 10 people a day, or if you have to convince Virginia and not the entire United States, or you have to convince Richmond and not all of Virginia, or England instead of the EU European Union. Um, so all of these strategies, I, I think that they benefit from secession because it, it means that you don't need to sort of shoot as far uh, and can actually realize a change uh, even before. Not only this, but uh, secession uh, also makes, by definition, of course, it makes states smaller. And smaller states have a lesser capacity for socialism. And the reason is because, of course, they have a smaller tax base. They can't go to war as easily. Uh, war is, uh, you know, as they say, war is the health of the state. Um, that's very helpful. Um, they tend to be more free market. Um, they tend to be uh, less interventionist, obviously. And uh, this sort of creates a climate in which people are going to be able to um, perceive libertarianism as a more viable option. And finally, even if the group that secedes is the status group. Like after Trump won, uh, you know, we talk about uh, California wants to secede and whatnot. Well, that's still great because they can have their, you know, communist dictatorship or whatever. Now the people over here, we don't need to convince them in order to make things happen a little more effectively. So this is why I think secession is very important. And uh, finally, I think it's a tactically superior approach. As said, uh, Jeff Deist in his um, talk at the Mises Institute, what must be done to convince libertarians to break away from the state and convince statists to break away from the state. So uh, I, I see a lot of advantages to it. Okay, very good, very good. So, so I guess maybe, uh, uh, maybe I, you know, coming at this from a little different, different of an angle, but um, I, 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 yeah, I, back in July, I did a show on secession. It was a two hour broadcast on uh, an anarchist against secession. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll cover it. I'll, I'll cover it real briefly. Obviously, this is two hours. So uh, for those of you who are listening, who kind of hear this and you say, "Well, okay, that's that's good and all," but I don't think it's it's you know all there. Well, that's it was a two-hour broadcast. I don't want to rehash all of that stuff over again. So, uh, so in this example, I'm using Texas because you know, like they've been like, you know, home to like the most like secession, uh, like the secession movements. Uh, you know, <laughs> sure, uh, is one of those states. So, so uh, the example is Texas. So the first question to ask is, who makes the decision to secede? Uh, well, secession, secession isn't explicitly named in uh, the Texas Constitution, but since it would be a drastic change in governance, uh, it would likely require an amendment process, uh, kind of probably what, like what, uh, what happened uh, with, with Brexit. So how, how does this work in Texas then? So let's take, let's take a look at that. Uh, so as per uh, Article 17 of the Texas Constitution, uh, first off, the legislature proposes the amendments to the Constitution to be approved by two-thirds of the House and the Senate. So this isn't, uh, you know, like uh, Texas Secession Group, uh, you know, putting an amendment on the ballot. This is the legislature. This is the mm -hmm. legislature. Uh, number two, if it, uh, it is voted on by Texans. And three, if it passes, the governor announces that it becomes part of the Constitution, and then I guess Texas would secede. And here's my major issue with secession and looking at it from like the actual process that would have to happen for a state to secede. And that's, you know, if they actually can, because there's, you know, there's, there's nothing really clear about that. But uh, this is just like state nullification insofar as it requires grassroots lobbying, voters, political rulers, etc. Uh, the grassroots, the grassroots lobbying and, the, and, you know, running for office, you got to get your guys in the legislature to actually propose this amendment. If you don't have, you know, like, I guess I would say like 99.9% .9 of the uh, Texas legislature now isn't even thinking about secession. Uh, so you'd have to get those people in there first before you could even consider, before it could even be voted on uh, by Texans. Uh, and then you have to rely on, you know, irrational voters, uh, likely status, uh, to, to get this thing to pass. 
So yeah, it requires reformism, which is uh, one reason I don't see it happening, you know, anytime soon, uh, if at all. Uh, so yeah, again, uh, July 24th broadcast of LUA. Uh, if you just Google secession, liberty under attack, uh, you guys can find that and uh, definitely recommend checking that out. I was joined by uh, Gary Hunt in the first hour and, uh, he, we kind of went through the history and in the second hour, I kind of provide, uh, my, my, uh, you know, arguments for, for why I'm against it. But, uh, uh, but with that, with that said, Matt, uh, but what do you think about, uh, about what I said? Well, uh, it's an interesting point And I mean, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely tr true. Um, the objection that I would I would say to that though is um, okay yes you have to you know get your guys in there do all these kinds of you know political stunts but um, let's say you're living in I don't know England uh, the day before the Brexit thing happened okay now um, the if you're going to regard anything other than waking up tomorrow morning and in Capitalistan as a total failure um, then you know, that, that's a little bit of a, of a, of a difficult situation. But uh, I would say that in respect to, oh, well, we have to, you know, you, you need um, uh, politics or you need a ballot initiative, whatever. Well, you're ha we have uh, politics and you have uh, ballot initiatives pretty much every day. Um, that part really doesn't seem to change. You know, we're, you, Texas still has a, a legislature. We still have, you know, the U.S. Congress, you know, the European Union still has Brussels. Um, the, the, the elections still happen, all that kind of stuff goes on. The only difference is that the result of one of them could be a smaller state in which you could um, uh, conceivably use more, uh, or you can use different options uh, to convince of uh, your, your end goal. So, I, I mean, yeah, it, it's true, but it's, it's also true even if there's no secession movement, you know? Hmm. Okay, so I has just one question I thought of: Would you would you uh, would you vote uh, in favor of like if there was uh, you know uh, so like there there in Virginia it was proposed you know like a secession uh, secession initiative or something? Uh, would you uh, would you vote uh, yes on that? Uh, it would largely depend on the uh, the terms and conditions of it. You know, sometimes it's it's not all what it seems to be. You know, if it was, are we do we leave the state of Virginia and become autonomous? Yeah, I'd vote yes on that. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and that, that's also something interesting about Texas, too, because uh, Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution, they can abolish their governments. Yep. Uh, the, the people can abolish their government if they want to. So uh, I, would, I would hope I would hope that uh, in Texas uh, they would, you know, just skip the whole uh, secession and, you know, like smaller government and just, uh, you know, uh, uh, just eliminate the damn thing. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> well, what, I, what I'd, like to, I'd like to know, though, is, you know, what uh, what's the argument? I suppose because um, I mean I'm generally asking right now. Um, what is um, your argument or his argument against um, you know waking up tomorrow in the same situation we're in, or waking up tomorrow in a uh, seceded state? Uh, why would the why would the former ever be preferable to the latter? Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely uh, that's definitely a good question. Um, but uh, and there are, there are a lot of things I touched upon in in, in that uh, in that broadcast. Uh, first off, I mean, uh, like if Texas were to actually, uh, I mean, yeah, obviously I'd prefer you know what uh, I'd prefer to you know uh, have lower taxes and you know a smaller state and, and all of that. Well, I prefer mm -hmm. no state. But uh, but uh, I. I I yeah I I don't participate in politics I wouldn't I wouldn't vote on that or anything I wouldn't advocate for that I guess one of one of the concerns I have and this is something that we talked about was uh, the potential you know violent ramifications by the state like a, t a state as big as Texas uh, mm -hmm. decides to secede uh, there could be a major backlash by the uh, by by the feds uh, and I don't think that would be uh, you know uh, <laughs> I don't know would that would that be better or worse than, than well, the situation well the feds aren't right. exactly peaceful people with tactful you know responses to potentially dangerous situations anyway um, yeah at least. Uh, at least in that situation, you know, a state like Texas has a lot of leverage. I mean, they're uh, one of the largest economies in the world, and they have their own power grid. So to use uh, Texas as an example, I mean, that would probably be one of the, the most viable states that could actually pull that off. Um, and, you know, I mean, not just talking about Texas. There was a Venetian secession movement in um, Italy for a while. Uh, yeah. All of these things uh, seem to be, you know, not all – I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll count. I mean, I haven't done this – yeah, but I mean, for the sake of argument, I, you know, I can count how many secession initiatives there have been in the last 10 years. And I'd also count how many initiatives there have been um, to uh, establish anarcho-capitalism. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that it, it, when you when you do that, it, it seems like, yes, well, this is vastly superior. You know, you may get that initiative in a seceded state before you get it in this huge super state. 
Plus, when the states are smaller, you have more of them. You can vote with your feet a little bit, you know. Um, yeah. they, they, you have a, a situation where people would go to Liechtenstein or something because taxes in most European states are too high. And, you know, this is going to be an incentive for them to lower some taxes. Or, you know, if uh, the Venetians wanted to lower taxes and they break, broke, or broke away from Italy, you know, um, maybe that's an incentive for other for Italy to lower its taxes so they don't lose them to the new Venetian state if there was one to be created. Um, so, I mean, there, there seem to be just these bountiful, um, you know, um, reasons to, to be in favor of this. So I, I'm still not really yeah. entirely clear yep, on yep. the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so debt. so so I guess my 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 main argument against it would be that uh, I advocate for direct action, taking initiative, you know, and finding freedom now. Yeah. Uh, not not put put it. There's there's no solution through politics, in, in, in my right. in my opinion. Uh, the issue the, the the main issue I have with secession it's it's kind of it's kind of like uh, you know uh, uh, journalification. Uh, you've, uh, you, there's, you can't really take the initiative. Uh, you, you kind of have to wait around for just using Texas again. You got to wait for the people to get into the legislature. You got to wait for the, uh, for the entire process to happen. You can't really take the initiative. You're still just sitting around there and waiting and hoping that, uh, you know, hopefully in five years, hopefully this goes through and then Texas mm -hmm. will be seceded. Um, and that's the yeah, same thing with journal. You have to wait for the government to call you. And then even if you get called, uh, it might be like like for, uh, when I was uh, called uh, called for uh, jury summons last May. Uh, it was a it right. wasn't a victimless crime, so I couldn't use their nullification anyways. Uh, right. So th so that's the main one. I mean, you're it's it's waiting around now. If people want to advocate for secession and then also like you know uh, direct action in the meantime, <laughs> uh, I suppose that would be uh, that would yeah, be better. That's what I was what I was going to say is um, when I when I when that quote that you read uh, did not in any way exclude other methods. Um, uh, I just think that uh, secession is something that comes up very frequently. You know, um, it's something that stays talked about. People know what it is. You know, I don't need to explain. You know, a secession to people. I need to explain anarcho-capitalism stuff like that. Um, and in the meantime, yeah, these things are great. And um, I mean, maybe depending on where you live, it can be more viable versus less viable. Uh, but uh, I just uh, doing. You know, like I, I use Cal's Liberate RVA thing. Um, as an example, um, and uh, you've had him on this show before, so you know much of what he, he mm -hmm. does, what he stands for. Now, um, uh, I went over to his place uh, several months ago, and you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you I'm not a big fan of the city of Richmond. I, I can't wait to get out of Richmond. Um, but that, that's not political. It's just I just don't like the city. And uh, you know, he, he was uh, sort of getting on my case a little bit. He was like, you know, man, we're liberate RVA. We, we got to love Richmond. We got to be – we got to care about Richmond, right? And I'm like, well, don't you want to establish this system – uh, everywhere. It's like, yeah, yeah, but we need to worry about Richmond right now, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it's right because you can't do you can't do what he's doing for the whole world right now. Um, and I'd, I'd love to say to, to, to somebody then, well, would your job not then be easier if Richmond was one third the size? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I definitely suppose, uh, I definitely suppose it, it, it could be, and yeah, that, that's the secession thing has kind of been. Uh, I'm sure you've seen on, on, on fascist book the, uh, the, the seemingly endless debates on open versus closed borders, and secession yeah. always comes up. And I, I, I understand the, the arguments. Uh, uh, I understand the arguments for secession. I think some of them are, are definitely valid. Um, so, so yeah, the, the my, I guess my. The, what I, uh, what I started off with uh, the actual like long process that it would take for like Texas, for example, to actually secede. Then the fact that direct action um, that it, you can't really take the initiative and and you know and and, mm. and do this yourself tomorrow uh, it takes a lot of waiting. Yeah, and also it's it's just it's just the, the and then the final one is is you know I call people out for their inconsistencies inconsistencies a lot uh, like you know anarchist politicians and things. I think that's uh, that's that's not. Uh, uh, that's not good. It's not consistent with the philosophy. And uh, even no, and, and it's you know, no, regardless of the situation, whether it's uh, uh, whether if someone's voting for a tax increase or whether someone's you know voting for uh, secession, uh, I still I, I still just I can't advocate for uh, I can't advocate for or, or you really support people that are participating in the political system. But what's uh what what's uh the matter with um in your opinion like what's the so, you know, you do this direct action thing, you can get up, you could do it tomorrow, and, it, and it's great. But if, if five years down the road, your constituency was to somehow shrink, maybe half the size, you need to do that to a lot less people now. I mean, that, it should make things easier. So it, it, it complements uh, these other methods, I, I believe. It, it, do, you, do you not think it does? I, no, I, 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 would say that, I would say that you're right, yeah. 
Okay. I, I, would, I would say that that would make it easier. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely concede there. I just, I just don't participate in politics. And I, gotcha, I gotcha. That. So that, so yeah, and 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 people have called me a purist, and uh, I, I take that, uh, that uh, label as you know a commendation. Uh, <laughs> so I, and yeah, and I, I've gotten in, in some of these discussions. Well, I don't too, vote on but... politicians. I'll, t I'll tell you that right away. Um, the only time I've ever been able to justify it is when, uh, you know, the, one, the outcome is. 50 50 is either this or that and one of them is just unbelievably better than so like uh if, if someone is to say hey are we going to increase taxes by 10 percent? are we going to decrease them by 10 percent?" i can see myself voting on that because i can see the clear you know the answer there um but uh in terms of most political referendums and processes no i i would i would not even bother with those either yeah yeah and i actually, I actually can't uh, i couldn't participate if i wanted to because i canceled my voter registration i definitely advocate people uh cancel their voter registration tinyurl.com forward slash uh actually i forgot the short for that i'll put it in the show in the uh, description but it's libertyunderattack.com it's a tab at the top cancel your voter registration all of it, uh, there's 39 states where I, I went through and found legal citations for the process of cancellation uh definitely uh definitely recommend that uh so yeah i couldn't vote even if i wanted to uh, it's pretty much all I had. Uh, I guess any closing thoughts for the listeners on the secession, then we'll, or uh, you know, just overall uh, uh, about your book, what we discussed tonight, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, just on the secession thing, I just wanted to make absolutely clear to everybody listening that uh, I d definitely did not say in my book, nor have I ever said that this is something that is, you know, the say all, end all, all you need to do, the only thing you ever should do. I just said that it's something that comes up a lot. Um, people know what it is, and it's very, very, very helpful. So it warrants support. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's as far as I'd go with that. Uh, my book, unfortunately, is out of stock right now, but um, hopefully that'll be back in stock uh, fairly soon. Usually they takes about a week um, before they replenish the stock. And uh, to watch out for my come next book, which uh, I'm hoping to have published this year again by Arctos Media LTD. Okay. Very good. Very good. And yeah, I, I, and as I said before, I definitely recommend you pick up uh, pick up his book, The Consequences of Equality. You can do that by visiting tinyurl.com forward slash Matt B L U A, and you can help support Liberty Under Attack uh, in the process. So, Matt, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show today. It was an interesting sure. discussion, and uh, uh, and I'm really glad we got to you know have that conversation about yeah, the yeah, me too. secession. So, uh, all right, well, thank you so much, man. Uh, you have a, a great rest of your evening, and we'll we'll definitely get you back on. I'm sure there's some other subjects uh, that we could cover uh, that would uh, you know be beneficial for the listeners as yeah, well yeah. as. Uh, uh, as well as uh, for us. So uh, thanks so much, and uh, you have a great rest of your evening, sir. Hey, you too. Thank you very much. And there's my interview with Matt Battaglioli, the author of The Consequences of Equality. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. To support LUA and pick up a copy, just visit tinyurl.com forward slash Matt B-L-U-A. Now, I certainly value Matt's insight on these subjects. I think he covered some lesser-discussed aspects of egalitarianism that are particularly significant, such as the cultural consequences. You know, art, music, and infrastructure. That said, I'd like to give you a little taste of a song he mentioned, 433 by John Cage. Please enjoy. <laughs> no, he wasn't kidding, guys. John literally sits down at the piano, closes it, and just sits there. And it has almost two and a half million views on YouTube. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> so in regards to our discussion about secession, I mentioned the potential backlash from the feds if a state as big as Texas decided to concede, but I forgot to mention the 31 total U.S. military installations in Texas. They aren't just going to turn those over to the Texans. <laughs> Considering that, I don't think anyone should honestly be advocating for secession unless they are comfortable with the idea of shooting government agents and self-defense, because that would likely be necessary, especially for Texas. And considering libertarians' near silence on use of force issues, I don't think most would feel comfortable with that. I really don't think so. Alright, just a few quick notes. First off, again, the Direct Action Series is now available for free. All you have to do is go to libertyunderattack.com forward slash freedom now and uh, secure yourself a copy today. You'll just fill out that form and you'll be taken to the page where all of those archives are available. Secondly, if you enjoy this podcast or LUA more generally, please consider leaving us a positive review on iTunes. It will help us get our content in front of more listeners and uh, you can do that uh, by visiting tinyurl.com forward slash LUA iTunes for the short link. Uh, or, you know, you can just uh, go to the iTunes app and find Liberty Under Attack Radio and uh, do it that way. We'd certainly appreciate it. You can also support the show financially. 
We prefer Bitcoin donations, but Patreon is a close second. If you chip in as little as $1 a month there, you will get early access to every podcast and you'll receive exclusive content. Trust me, you're going to want to subscribe. I've got a lot of uh, really interesting and, uh, and some exciting things in the works. You can also make a one-time or monthly contribution via PayPal. For all of those ways to support us, just visit the website libertyunderattack.com. For those of you who share this podcast with your friends and family, thank you so much. That also helps us greatly in our goals as the more folks that listen, the more practitioners of direct action there will be. So please do that as well. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Google+, or you can find my personal account for my daily ramblings. Just search for Shane Radliff and you'll find my profile. That's all I've got for you. I'll talk to you guys next week. Liberty Under Attack dot com.